The Scream Kings are in no way responsible for any encounters with the paranormal, extraterrestrial abductions, eldritch insanity, hauntings, hexes, curses, demonic possessions, cryptozoological sightings, or any loss of sleep from listening to this podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Scream Kings podcast. I'm NJ Gallegos. And this is Max George. The first time any of you stay the night with me, it's when a podcast is trying to murder us. (gasps) (gasps) Gasp in gay. (laughs) There's a lot of gay today, listeners, because we have the illustrious, beautiful Elton Skelter with us. Thank you. I've never been called beautiful before. Well, you are beautiful. Thank you. So are you. (laughs) <laughs> Both of stop you. it but keep oh, going stop it. keep going <laughs> stop it but don't <laughs> don't actually stop ever ever just keep it rolling listeners we have a gaggle of gays today our sweet token straight nathaniel is not with us and you know what it should be june because it's going to be pride month today <laughs> as we <laughs> talk about all things gay um, especially a wonderful horror movie that Elton recommended that is... No, that he picked. <laughs> not recommend it. He picked oh, okay. it. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Fair enough. Because, uh, yeah, it's a, it's going to be a journey, but a fun, fabulous, glitter-filled journey. Before we dive into that, though, NJ, uh, do you want to introduce Elton a little bit more formally? I sure would. So my friend, Elton Skelter, pronouns he, they, is a queer horror author hailing from the southwest of England and is also the co-host of the Cutthroat Queens podcast. He has several works that include Next of Kin, Monomania, Let's Get Fucked Up and Die, Life Support, Fuck You, Mary Sue, and more. (laughs) Welcome! (laughs) Thank you for having me. It's so nice to be here. I'm a big fan. Uh, well, I'm a big fan of your accent. I may or may not uh, love a good English accent, so I apologize if it gets hot and steamy over here. Well, as long as you don't mock it as much as, as sweet Chelsea Pumpkins does. She, ah. she does. <laughs> she, she, she thinks I'm like an extra from like Mary Poppins. Or, uh, oh, no. She's always like, pip, pip, lad. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I that will not her, be though. me. <laughs> it, it will, but it will be me. I'm not going to lie to you. I know. I, I could already tell you already broke into it once. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will just sickness. be drooling. And we'll, we'll balance each other out. <laughs> okay. That sounds fair. That sounds fair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Elton, do you mind telling us a little bit about yourself, how you got into horror? Kind of give us your origin story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm 39. Uh, going on 75 and I, I um that. yeah everything <laughs> aches and I'm just I'm tired all the time <laughs> um I am a writer um not full-time unfortunately there is no money in this game um but I work as a medical secretary during the day and yeah that's pretty much it really I'm, I'm kind of a, a nothing person I love horror I love movies and tv and i love to write um and that that's kind of me in a nutshell but in terms of my horror origin story i have told this one before but um the year was 1993 and i saw oh. jurassic park for the first time oh hell yeah yeah and then i subsequently saw it another 20 times with all of my pocket money saved and <laughs> i started to dress a little bit like laura dern so. Oh, <laughs> iconic! Yeah, I I had like white blonde hair, and I used to wear these little like khaki shorts and walking boots with my socks pulled up, and a little neck scarf and a button down, and I just carried a paintbrush everywhere with me that I went, and I was just I just I just loved oh it, gosh. and I I just used to get these little notebooks and write down stuff about dinosaurs, and that's where I discovered that I loved being scared. Um, okay, one, dinosaurs are fucking amazing. Absolutely. So, uh, hell yeah. Two, we're best friends already. I wore a black glove in the third grade because I wanted to be Luke Skywalker. So, so you going to say Michael Jackson. <laughs> <then>. <laughs> I thought so too. <laughs> Had I seen another child dressing up for, as a movie character, essentially cosplaying, 
we would have been buds. We would have. We would have. We would have gravitated towards each other. Me and my little Laura Dern. I'd have been like, run, and you'd have been like, no, <laughs> no. You'd have lost the hand. Run. I'd have been carrying Samuel L. Jackson's arm. It would have just. Oh. Yeah. It would have been oh. perfect. This is Please tell me you guys have pictures of this because I would like to like see it and then compose it more properly in my brain. No, I was the kind of person where if you point a camera at me, I would cry. Uh, there are a few pictures of me as a child, but I'm crying in all of them and like trying to like put my hand in front of the camera, like holding a Kleenex from all the tears and just being like, no, don't look at me. So no, there is nothing. There is nothing at all. And the so only thing that I dramatic. have. Yeah. <laughs> Such a surprise when I came out. <laughs> the only evidence I have is a birthday cake that I asked my mom to make a lightsaber birthday cake, and in her sweet Mormonism, she made what she thought that meant, and it is, it is a cake. Is that your gay origin story? Is it? Is it a strangely phallic cake? <laughs> uh huh. Very phallic. <laughs> So, oh, no. thanks, Mom. You made me this way. Um, it's all coming together. What is, it really what's is. the yeah. scariest horror movie you've seen, Elton? Is it Jurassic Park? Um, at the time it was, but um, yeah. I think the first. I'm really into slashes, so the first movie that the horror movie that I saw that like changed my outlook on on what I wanted to watch and what I wanted to consume and what I wanted to put out there was Scream. Um. I watched it. We we had a uh, rented VHS when I went to my friend's house because his parents didn't mind him watching R-rated movies, and we watched it. And I just remember Drew Barrymore and that opening scene and being like, "Holy shit!" Like oh, just, so it good. changed me viscerally. That coupled with and we're gonna we're gonna brush over this very very quickly. Rob Zombie's 2007 remake of Halloween. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very controversial. It's very controversial. Yeah. But for me, the Halloween franchise, you've got 78 Halloween, which is what I refer to as mainstream horror literature. And then mm -hmm. you've got Rob Zombie, which is splatterpunk version of it. Yeah, anything that Rob Zombie touches just kind of splatters. That's, that's mm. a perfect verb yeah. there. It's Plus lovely, that man though, is I so big. <laughs> Tyler Maine is such a large lad. I love it. Yeah. He is I also love how he's just like, and here's my wife. <laughs> in everything, yeah. She died in the last one. Let's bring her back as a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> he never stops. Only in a horror movie. <laughs> All right. So you've written one or two things, it sounds like, Elton. A couple. A couple. Oh, so shy. <laughs> <laughs> um, NJ, do you want to talk about Next of Kin and kind of introduce oh. this? crazy book i love next of kin so i did a second reread of the book um but elton was so kind to give me an arc copy and i devoured it um so i've been telling people it's like american psycho meets romeo and juliet or romeo and julio julio <gasps> oh wait and you mean there's like, gays in it there are gays. We are oh, unabashedly gay. Oh, it is a gay day. Yeah. Uh, continue, um, continue. Uh, so, the story follows a very unlikely couple. Um, one who is a serial killer, and the other who, after a suicide attempt, has the serial killer listed as his next of kin, although they've never met. So it's almost a, a cat and mouse game for a little bit until it gets very, very splattery and gooey. And a bit sexy. <laughs> a bit very sexy. I was like, oh, like yeah. I'm, I think I'm into this. <laughs> okay. Well, I thought I would, I would write some sex into it for the male male romance ladies of Central America, but apparently they hate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's America. We're going through a lot right now. Who it's knows true. what's happening? It'll be this transplanted <laughs> Miss Western or loved it. I, I would you. read the scenes a couple times, you know, just for the, the imagery and, and the beautiful language, obviously. Bless you. Bless you. That's so sweet of you. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a, it's the first book I wrote, actually. It came out. Is it really? I, yeah, it's the fourth release that I did, but it was the first one I wrote. 
Um, I wrote it just after I had my first story published with Dark Matters Inc. And um, Sadie Hartman, who is Mother Horror, was my beta reader for it. Um, <gasps> and yeah, it just she she gave me such amazing feedback. Um, and it started off much smaller, and then she was like, "No, you can do more. You can do more. Get into it." And um, and it just it grew into what it was. And even that started from a short story. Uh, the first chapter was initially just a standalone short story, but I was like, I need to know more about this man. Mm. And then it just it became its own thing. It That's just really it, cool. it blossomed. Yeah. How did you come up with the idea in the first place? Um, I used to want to write romance. So it originally came to me as a romance story. It was still called Next of Kin, but it was about just a sweet man who got a call one day about a... a wayward younger chap who who tried to kill himself and he was the only person that he could rely on in the world and they they you know he takes him home and they fall in love and then i was like but what if and um yeah then it spiraled oh. into a slashy psychological I, I don't know I, I find it difficult to call it horror it is a horror story but it's also i think it's more aligned with sort of thriller I don't know. And I don't know how to I, you, define it. You captured the, the romance of it, honestly, quite well. Like, whenever I had read it the first time, I was reading it on my Kindle, and my wife was asleep, and I was just, like, sobbing at the last <laughs> couple chapters. <laughs> <laughs> I, love I was that. like, they loved each other. <laughs> did they did? But you know, oh. I, I, there's, there's a version of it as well with like in my brain somewhere that I never got to write that they did end up happily together and it worked out in the end. But you know, that's not what people want to read. I, I don't think. Well, I mean, I could probably rewrite it and re-release it again with that different ending, and people would be like, okay, yeah, now I like it. But I think you have to read this one to realize that you kind of that was the better ending. <laughs> Yeah, you could do a, a second publication, and it's like, choose your own ending. And yes. Ooh, uh, that's I, fun. I, I don't understand how they work, but I would love to do that with these characters, because <laughs> I just, I feel like, I feel like they, they didn't quite get the time they deserved together. They didn't. No. And I, I wanted to commend you on how well you write a complex character. The, you know, these people, these, these two men, you know, Jacob and Nathan, they're very flawed, dark, but they have this other side to them that's just, it humanizes them, you know, and you don't see them as just evil. Yeah, I think that was the, that was the trick, the, the really, really tricky part about doing it was making Jacob <clears throat> come from this clearly sociopathic uh, mental person and then, you know, turning him from the Grinch to Santa Claus and making people follow along for the ride. Um, and it was tricky, but it just, I think because Nathan himself was such a flawed character, they brought out the best in each other, even though they were doing each other damage. And it kind of, it lent into a weird sort of dichotomy of complexity where they were, they were good for each other in the worst possible way. And it was like non-sustainable. And I think that was sort of a really interesting way of looking at two people together like that. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. I like I've I've told Twitter like ten times. Like this was probably <laughs> this was one of the top ten books that I've read in the last year. Oh god! Bless you. Wow. I yeah. uh, I blush every time I see you say something nice about me because I'm a big fan of yours as well. So <laughs> stop it, Elton. Stop it. We should do a crossover. Let's see what happens when Casey and Jacob meet each other. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Mm. I want to be intrigued. involved. I'll be the model. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be the, uh, what's it called, Chester, whatever it's called, from Midnight, Midnight Kiss. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll, I'll be the cover art of the book. How about that? <laughs> Absolutely. <Perfect. I'm> in. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> um, all right. Should we kind of shift focus here from your beautiful, sexy, gay slasher and talk about another beautiful, sexy, gay slasher? Let's do it. Let's talk about Midnight Kiss. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Everyone, you are in for a treat. If you have not seen this film, it is available for anyone who has a Hulu, now Disney Plus subscription. Uh, it's a Bloomhouse production, and the director is Carter Smith, and the writer is Erlinger Thorodson. And if Erlinger Thorodson isn't gay, that name is not doing him any service. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's you certainly read, a mouthful. <laughs> you read Thorodson and it sounds like Throbson. Yeah, and probably. I'm sure there's a porn out there called Throbson. <laughs> Only one I way apologize. to find out. We'll have to oh. get, get the Google search out. <laughs> to the Pornhub. <laughs> All right. NJ, do you want to give us a quick plot about... Well, I want Elton to give us a plot because Ooh. he just loves this film so much. Okay, to start with, I am a huge Carter Smith fan, so I love everything that he does, which is why I love this movie. Not necessarily because of what it offers, but because he is a fantastic director with an amazing eye, and he's a photographer as well, so he knows exactly what he's doing. But this is part of the um, Into the Dark Blumhouse anthology series, which is two series long, and each episode is inspired by a holiday, not just the, the usual suspects of Halloween and Thanksgiving, but it's also got like International Women's Day and International Pets Day and stuff like that. Like, there's, there's all different types of holidays. This one is about a group of gay friends who go away to one of their friends' summer houses, I guess, um, and they um, celebrate New Year in a club like they do every year. Um, but they play this game called Midnight Kiss, which is where you find someone at midnight and you have to kiss them. And it has to be consensual, and you have to not know them already. And for the, then, till the sun comes up, you can do whatever you want with them, and no one's allowed to judge you or tell you any different. And that's the game these friends have been playing for ages. One of them's now engaged and has brought his new fiance with them, and he's got an ex in the group, so there's like weird dynamics with it. Um, and then when the ex meets another person, it gets all very complicated. But there is a killer on the loose. I don't know if on the loose is kind of thing. He's just walking around this house really in a hoodie, but um, he he comes along and he starts picking the friends off right from the very beginning. Um, and you realise that maybe Midnight's Kiss wasn't such an innocent game, and maybe had some some uh, collateral damage from it in the years past. So <gasps> that's where we're at. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and just a reminder for everybody, we are a spoiler podcast, so if you do not want this work of art ruined for you, definitely <laughs> go check it out on Hulu. Uh, go watch it. It's only about an hour and 20 minutes. It's not that long. Um, you see a lot of butts, a lot of jock straps, um, a glitter, lot of hot... So much glitter. So much fucking glitter. And uh, a very spunky woman. I think she's the only one we see. <laughs> In the entire I film, so. I think that, I think she is. Yeah, she's also yeah. the best part of the film as well. So. Whatever you leave Joel and Cam alone. <laughs> <laughs> sweet, sweet I, boys. Boys don't fight. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can share. <laughs> Deal. Um, so yeah, this film. It, it, I don't know if it was made tongue in cheek it didn't give me v b vibes at all i think bloomhouse did a pretty good job producing it um i think we can hold space and recognize that i think it's an important film as far as queerness goes we don't get a lot of gay centric like slasher horror like this elton you were i think i think uh, we don't get a lot of male focused gay centric horror like there we go Thank you. Les lesbians are much more elevated in terms of horror. And there's a lot uh, more lesbian <clears throat> content out there that's more serious and more um, relatable and more just artfully made. Whereas a lot of the time, gay men are the butt of the joke. <laughs> Excuse the pun. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I also think, you know, lesbians are a little bit more socially acceptable in the straight world, which is something I don't understand, but it, it exists. And so t I was really excited to see a movie that was primarily just gay men. And in the horror world, it was similar to how I was excited to see Full Frontal in Midsummer. Not because I was like, ooh, penis, but <laughs> I felt like it was doing something that has just been ignored and it yeah. feels so taboo. I don't know. What do you guys think? I, I think definitely in slashers, like, um, yeah. I think there's, there's a. Uh a tried and true sort of theory about us about slashes is you've got to have your final girl she's got to be spunky but feminine she's got to be hot but tough and she's got to be you know she's got to be the sydney prescott or the or the laurie strode and she's got to survive to the end with just a few a few injuries and then she's got to come back she's got to do it all over again 
Um, so that's kind of like the, the general makeup of it, but to see sort of men in, put in that vulnerable position of being the victim um, because of an emotional situation is, is pretty rare, I think, for, for this. The last thing we got in terms of gay cinema was bros, and that was oh, interesting. Jesus. <laughs> So uh, yeah, this is this is a real change from from the usual kind of stuff, and we are we are seeing a bit more sort of queer cinema coming oh, out definitely. now. I mean, this was like 2018, I think. Uh, um, 19. Yeah. 19. Yeah, and it's uh, yeah, it's it's a it was a real good step in the right direction, and it was enjoyable to watch. Had some uh, issues, and... but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we will talk about those. Yeah. NJ, what what are your thoughts about kind of this queer focus, gay men? conundrum i i really enjoyed it i found it to be very refreshing um kind of like elton said i think sometimes um like gay men are played as like the laugh you know they're kind of like the the funny friend or you know but they're kind of like desexualized almost Mm -hmm. a lot of times um and kind of going back to your point with the midsummer um you know when you see the full frontal and whatnot it's it's always been about like you know, the female gaze in a lot of these horror movies of the past, where it's just like gratuitous, you know, they're running around scantily clad, screaming and just being ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And I think this movie turned that on its head very well. And I didn't feel that it interpreted any of the the men as like weak or anything of that nature either. For sure. I think it, it also sort of gave that interesting sort of look at Hannah as the foil for that. Whereas the gay man is usually played as the like, like you say, the sidekick, the best friend. Uh, she was there feeling that the whole way through. She's like, "Damn, I'm with a bunch of gays. I'm the only straight girl in this entire movie, and uh, and I'm just sort of here as a, an extra tag along. I'm just sitting here, but oh shit, you know, I'm getting in the way of something really, really big happening." So she kind of that was also a statement, I think, on sort of turning it all on its head and being like, "Okay, so usually it's the you know the nerdy guy as the sidekick, or you know." Uh, but now we've got the the beautiful girl as the sidekick, and the the men take the center stage as being the the helpless victims. Mm. True, I love that. Yeah, um, I think we should kind of <clears throat> go over the the key characters just so as we continue talking about the pros and cons, we can refer back to them. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the married or slash engaged couple. I guess they're not married quite yet. That's Joel and the Logan. And Joel is the biggest dick, but God, I want him to do things to me. Oh, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> he is he is Captain America's brother, played by oh. Scott Evans. He is <laughs> yes. um, he is beautiful, and also it's very important to know that he's wearing horn rimmed glasses in this, like a murderer. That will come back later. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, Logan is his fiance, and then we have Cameron, who's played by Augustus Prue, who's also quite a looker. Um, and, British. We have, and I did not know that. Yes, he's British. He's a very, very British boy. With a name like Ooh. Augustus Prue. He's British, that, clearly. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> we have their somewhat flamboyant, femme forward uh, Zachary, who's played by Chester Lockhart. And then, of course, the token girl, Anna, um, played by Aiden Mayeri. I love her. She's such a good She's actress. She's great. I think, is it appropriate to say that she was the fruit fly of the group? No? Uh, absolutely. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> she was also the, 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 once you get past the, the initial gooey feelings for Scott Evans, she was also the hottest character in the entire film as well. Okay, Elton, you're Agreed. forgetting about Augustus Prue. <laughs> See, I <laughs> love him. I do. I've been a big fan of him for ages. I, I recently saw Dear David, which was the uh, horror movie based on Adam Ellis's tweets about a like sickly Victorian ghost living in his house. Um, and that was really good. I really like him as an actor, and he's got a fantastic, non-wavering American accent, which I really appreciate. That but is true. Scott Evans has my heart. Scott Evans also has my heart. We can share. Okay. <laughs> deal <laughs> um okay let's kind of dive into what we liked about the film um who wants to start i shall start if that is all right absolutely, absolutely not <laughs> <laughs> next <laughs> go for it 
Um, I found the opening scene, you know, kind of talking about how you enjoyed um, Drew Barrymore's opening scene in Scream. It, it kind of gave me echoes of that. Um, so we open on one of their friends, Ryan, who is packing up to go on a vacation rather than going to the um, Palm Springs Midnight Kiss party. And, you know, the killer, he's, he's trying on his trunks and let's, I was, I paused and I did not see anything that I wanted to Some, see, which I upset tried, me. I tried. <laughs> they, they did it really well. The camera was in all the wrong places. I know. I was like, but we did get a lot of butt. (laughs) Yeah, a nice butt too, honestly. Yeah. Um. Yeah. yeah. So you know, Ryan's getting ready. He gets in the shower, obviously, very naked, and the killer. You know, you just feel the tension because you know that the killer's coming. It's that horrible feeling of you're in your safe place, totally naked, totally vulnerable, and the killer (laughs) pulls the curtain back and slices him across the throat. Then he throws confetti on him. Mm. <laughs> Such a glitter bomb. Uh, and it, 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 was, it was just great. And I thought that it was very realistic as well. Like it wasn't just, you know, all of a sudden he just dies. Like you see him suffering. Yeah. 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 It was very reminiscent, I think, of Scream with the Drew Barrymore. Uh, it just it kind of set the tone for the movie because we're going to shift after that scene into a lot of these kind of complexities that exist in gay culture and the you know cattiness that exists and so we we have this idea of there's a murderer but spill the tea girl we gotta know the deets and it's just this really fun game at the beginning yeah it seems like it's all been like orchestrated there's a a little note card that comes uh hand delivered to his house stuck under his door which immediately would red flag the hell out of me i'd be locking everything but this yeah. guy is too busy I mean, wandering around practically naked and going for a shower there's a lot of showering in this film <laughs> it's true it's true very clean gay. very clean people <laughs> very clean until the glitter starts oh my god i know you must have to shower every minute of the day with the amount of glitter this guy's throwing around <laughs> um i do want to mention i thought that the group dynamic was very realistic and fun um everyone had a very clear-cut personality and the writing, I think, really aided in fleshing them out in fun in various ways. Joel is this neurotic, anal, hmm, wink, wink, uh, <laughs> kind of type A guy who I resonate very dearly with when he was talking about, like, the oh, yeah, there's a Google Drive, and have you checked the itinerary? I am guilty of both of those things. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have Cam, who's more the artistic, the free spirit. You have... Joel's fiance, who's Logan, who's kind of this outsider, very pure, gay, who's a prude. Um, and then you have the fabulous Zachary, who's everything. And I, I just felt like it was very realistic. I, I, yeah. They did a good job. Yeah, I think if, like, you know, if you have a, a collection of gay friends and you wanted to sort of make a cross section of what that would be like, these like four different character types plus Hannah, would be exactly how you can imagine sort of a very, very interesting intertwining friendship group, especially with the, like, the weird history that you come to find out that Joel and Cam had. They they were former partners, now turned just friends, frenemies, maybe? I don't know. Friends. Yeah. Um, and sort of uh, Cam ends up sort of starting to be a bit triggered by seeing the behavior that made him break up with Joel being enacted on a different person and starting to sort of get in his feels about it, which puts a bit of a wedge between them to start with. Yeah, and then you have Hannah there, who's kind of the glue through everything. And her character really was the most grounded. I loved her. Um, NJ, do you want to talk to us about the scene at the pool when everyone is just... <laughs> diving in time. <laughs> pun intended <laughs> he's got jokes everybody <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they get to i think it's joel's parents house who are obviously very loaded um they have this very nice house in palm springs they're hanging out at the pool and it's just this very relaxed 
scene in which they're filling Logan in essentially on all of the dynamics, who dated who, who banged who, you know, whatnot. But it, it felt very organic and it's not, it's, it's for the, both the audience and Logan, obviously. And I thought it was just very well handled. Yeah, they they do this fun thing where they're, uh, I don't know, Elton, have you been around a group of gays where it's, you're talking about people's past and you're being very jokey about it, but at the same time being very shady about it? Yes, yeah, (laughs) absolutely. (laughs) And it's uncomfortable, but you're laughing and giving daggers to each other, but also kind of aroused. (laughs) And, And it's... It just was so real. I've lived that pool scene before. I just really enjoyed the the dynamics going on there. Yeah, and and you could it, it kind of gave them this sort of this element of they've been friends for a long time, which is why you couldn't just walk away from this friendship group because a, a relationship didn't work out. These people are each other's family essentially, even though you know for better or, or worse, they they love each other and they've been friends for a long time. Right. Yeah. Don't you feel like it's like a yeah, gay lesbian thing for a group of people to be like that like, oh, we dated, but now we're friends and it's it's all just very very messy. <laughs> yes. But yes. it, it well, somehow uh, works. I would almost kind of push back against that in some capacity. I don't I, I, very messy. Yes. Uh I think what queer people have the advantage over straight people is we get to redefine sexuality in a lot of cases. And so when we're exploring ourselves and diving into these complexities, I think queer people explore in a much different kind of way than straight people. And there's good things and bad things that come of that, of course. Um, And that's not to say straight people aren't... Mm. Mm. (laughs) But I don't know. I, I think it's kind of taking back sexuality and redefining it within our, you know boxes of gay or lesbian or whatever yeah I love and I, th- I think i think it's a really like you know they're not the nicest characters as well they're some of them are pretty awful some of them are very narcissistic some of them are very sort of bitter and it's um <laughs> as much as i hate to say it it can be quite a reflection of of a queer friendship group where Absolutely. you don't have to put on a shiny happy front and be the, the the positive, you know, model of 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 happiness all the time. They're they're quite happy just to air their laundry in public and and be sassy about it and and just be cool about it. So I kind of loved that about them because it was it was quite realistic. Mm-hmm. Uh, rewatching it, this was the second time I've seen the film. It was pretty fun to kind of have insight into the Logan character and his background and the future of the plot and a lot of his quips and his lines were had tons of subtext to them Mm. and so knowing what was about to happen seeing that again for the second time it's like oh this guy's kind of a a douche a dick Mm. uh to use both the gay and the lesbian terms uh uh, i don't know what who wants to to talk to us about the plot twist with Logan? Oh, Logan. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know that we should include the talking about the plot twist in the pros because that very uh, firmly hits in the cons. That's that's Agreed. very good. Okay. We'll save it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um I oh, okay, I have on our notes these things should all be in the cons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <they> really... <laughs> uh, let's move that <laughs> um i do want to bring attention to the kills like we mentioned about the, the mm. beginning i thought the kills overall were pretty good uh, we had the shower scene the wine bottle up zachary's mouth Ooh. yeah that's um, gross yeah. When the killer shoots at Joel and hits like the glitter bomb. Oh it's my just, god. It's marvelous. I loved it. <laughs> it was marvelous <laughs> and so gay. Uh, it, that I had was a double take because I thought he was like, I thought he'd thrown another handful of glitter. I was like, do you just do that every time you draw blood? Like, this is so cool. You must have yeah. so much in your pocket right now. <laughs> it's a signature move, though. Think about it. I mean, just. <laughs> Oh my god. I, I want to go get just balls of glitter and when I'm around people, just launch them out. <laughs> Only when you draw blood, though. 
That's true. That's true. <laughs> That's you know what the worst allowed. part of that is, though? Like, the police are going to come to your house, and they're like, you can't get rid of glitter. They're just like, there's <laughs> fucking glitter everywhere. You're the killer. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> the poor there's... go-go boy in the club whose ass is just covered in glitter. It's like, it wasn't me, I swear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, um, I do... Speaking of the wine glass, that was Zachary's kill. He took a long nap, which Queen, right there. I know, right? Who doesn't love a nap? Who doesn't go on a vacation with your besties and is like, mm, I'm going to go take a nap? Yeah. Much <laughs> me all over, except I wouldn't get up for the party. I would just no. nap all day. Right, right. <laughs> um, I thought he died too soon, and I guess that's more of a con. I just really thought he brought my, they I, I can't assume their gender yeah. uh, just because they were so femme forward in this film um i wanted more of them i thought they were a real fun grounding dynamic especially for cam and then we just lose them so early on the thing i love about chester lock lockhart is that his name i think so yeah yeah um the thing i love about him him them is that anything that they've ever been in they are unabashedly just playing themselves uh-huh. <laughs> it's just like I, I they did a, a guest appearance on an episode of shameless where um he was they were ian's date and they went to the bar and it was just the same character like anything that they're in they are playing the same person and it's just them just flamboyant fun unabashedly gay unapologetic person and i loved it i love that about them yeah they don't give zero fucks or they don't give any fucks, whatever the, the the saying is. I can't talk. And can we talk about how good their hair is? My God. Ugh. Like, what are you... And using? the makeup? Yeah. And the no. skin? Ugh. Everything. The kimono. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's got to have a kimono. The way they woke up from the nap and they're just like, I'm going to have champagne now. <laughs> I woke up like this. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Oh, boy. Uh, we've already talked about how hot Joel is, but he is such a dick in this film. Oh, my God. He's insufferable. But, like, um, nobody calls him on it, though. This is the worst bit about it. And I think there's a lot of enabling in this group. Like, oh, when, absolutely. When, when Cam says, oh, I've just I've got my first gallery show for my photographs. Oh, he, God. He turns around and goes, oh, well, it must be one of our friends then. <laughs> as if to say, you don't have the talent to do it by yourself. This, you know, it has to be one of our friends that, that have done this for you as a favor. And, like, just the things he says like that and, like, the, the condescending tone he takes with Logan, like, shush, shush, nobody wants to listen to your music, be quiet, we'll put my playlist on. Like, But but I love your music, but nobody else does. Yeah. <laughs> it's, just, Ugh, it, it's just gaslighting. Asshole. Every word he says is just gaslighting, to, designed to bring everyone else down and to make him feel superior over them. And that's a very good character to have in a, in a film like this as well. But then his turn, is probably one of my favorite things about this entire entire film where he performs a kill within someone else's killing spree. Yeah, that was wild. I know, um, and it, it wasn't developed enough, I think because it's such a short movie as well, but it was so interesting to see him and his jealousy and his rage and his, his type A craziness take over. And when Cam brings sweet Dante back from the club, or he follows him home, which I thought was weird, um, when he does that, <laughs> And and Cam goes to get some condoms. Uh, you see Dante being murdered in the back garden, and then it pans up, and it's not the guy in the mask who is killing everyone else. It's Joel. So that kind of yeah. puts a bit of a spin mystery on: is Joel doing all of this, or is it uh, is it someone else? And Joel's just hidden a little kill in the middle of it that you can blame on someone else. Well, and it it was also pretty well done in the fact that another character had just been swimming, and you hear these mysterious sounds coming from the house, and then we don't see that character for several scenes. So we're assuming that they died as well. Um, I agree with you there, Elton. I think Joel's character was pretty complex, if we think about it. He clearly had a lot of trauma and a lot of stuff he needed to work out in therapy, and... But I that rage to kill somebody should have been explored a little bit more, and I guess this is a con. But yeah. I, when I first saw the film, it was like, oh shit, it's not the killer. Is he the killer? Who's the killer? 
Yeah, I, I kind of had him pegged as the killer from the get-go just because of his horrible, abhorrent personality, but it seemed too easy. And then you yeah. see him actually kill someone, and you're like, is he the one doing this? And then he just gets sketchier and sketchier as there, he's, he's trying to cover up that murder, not realizing there's other murders happening around him or another guy on the scene coming to, to take them all out. And then, obviously, you find out that it's not him. <sighs> he's had... great. It had promise. It did. It did. Um, NJ, talk to us about Cam being a final girl. Mm. You know I love a good final girl. Um, <laughs> I, I found him to be a great final girl. Um, although, I mean, technically he's not the last one standing at the movie, but he's obviously, like, the protagonist and the hero. Um, but he reacts, like, completely appropriately. You know, when they find Zachary's body, he's like, we're getting the fuck out of here! And he just sprints. Yeah. You know, he's like, yeah. I'm out. You know, I'm not he, dealing he's, with this. Yeah. yeah, no. He reacts appropriately, and he's like, we gotta get out of here! Yeah. And if there were stairs in that house, that he would not run up. He would, he would not. <laughs> he would. Very smart. I'm surprised he didn't, like, break the glass to save Hannah at that one point. Like, he's no nonsense. Yeah. And I found him to be like, you know, he, he has a, a point where he can get out of the house. He could just run off Leave. and be yeah. completely free of this situation. And he goes back to save his friends. Like, that's big. And I think he really went for Hannah, if I had to well, yeah. you know, bet on it. I, Although he, Joel... did, he, did, he did kind of jump to action when he saw Joel tied up. He kind of was like, Joel! And he ran in there without even thinking about his own safety. So he does care. You Wait, I him. blinked. I, I blinked. It was like I was watching the movie again. Can you scream Joel for us? Joel! <laughs> wow, I've watched it a fourth time now. <laughs> exactly how it sounded. <laughs> Although if he'd have done it in his actual accent, it'd be more like, Joel! Joel! Even that sounded kind of British there, Elton. Sorry. But he's played by a British man. If he'd have done it real, he'd have been like, Oh, it's Joel. I must save him. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> oh dear, Miss Marbles. Oh dear! <laughs> we gotta save him in it. <laughs> Look at them firecrackers! No, I don't know what that was. I'm sorry, that was bad. Oh my God, wow! <laughs> that was South really African bad. Much? <laughs> it might, I think so. I watch a lot of that... Below Deck. There's a lot of South African people on there. I'm sorry. Goodness. Um, let's let's wrap up the positives with two incredible quotes. NJ, do you want to give the first one? Uh, so you think that Hannah's down for the count because she gets slashed in the leg by the killer. And she's like, I can't walk. Go without me. And whenever <laughs> shit's starting to go down with the killer, she shows up, fucking decks him with, I'm not certain what it was exactly, and says- Like a shovel, I think? Yes, shovel. You're breaking a rule. It has to be consensual because the killer is making out with uh, Cam. Uh, and it, it's just like, I love a woman that can deliver a pun. It's like very action movie-ish, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. It was like the drop mic moment, wasn't it? Yeah. No, the, the drop mic moment was, was it Joel who just <laughs> screams, you're a fucking psychopath bottom? <laughs> <laughs> impeccable writing well done throbbing man <laughs> if uh nothing describes me more it's this so. <laughs> i'm gonna introduce myself as hi i'm max on screen king's podcast i'm a fucking psychopath bottom okay you, you guys have your favorite lines but mine mine is is actually like a, a socially responsible one when when Dante and Cam are in the garden and they're about to have sex and he asks if you got any condoms and they're like no blah 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 and he goes oh. well I'll go and get one then and then he um, Dante says well I'm on prep and Cam says you can do both I love that I was <laughs> yeah. like yes thank you for that thank you for for sharing your sexual responsibility with the world even in this uh, very gay centric problematic film <laughs> you still managed to uh, make a point there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right any other positives we want to talk before we rip this one a uh, new one 
Let's go. Yeah. Let's rip it. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, who who is gonna reveal who the killer was and why? Uh, I think it I has to I be Elton. No, it oh. has to be Elton. Oh yeah, Elton, you do oh, it. You do it. God. Okay. Because it's so painful for it him. It is. It is actually <laughs> painful. Like I, I'm pretty sure Lucas Gage read this script in another one of his manic episodes where he, <laughs> you know. Made a terrible choice and was like, "This seems like a really good motive." So uh, Logan is the killer, and his motive is that on New Year's Eve, two thousand thirteen, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was at a party with the, this group, and they were playing Midnight Kiss, and Cam was his Midnight Kiss, and then <gasps> he just walked away and didn't <gasps> talk to him again afterwards, and that's why he's killing them. Oh no! All of this, putting up with Joel for God knows how long, and for getting like engaged six to years, him. <laughs> and then yeah, just just holding all this rage in for for six years and being like, now I'm gonna put on a hood and I'm gonna go and kill these people in a, a weird sort of way. And then he does the weird thing as well, where he does the, like one minute he's completely like normal, like oh I'm a normal person. The next minute he's like crazy for going yeah. to the Um. <laughs> But I'm just like, was that just you just been boiling over this for a long time because someone kissed you and then and Well then and I I don't know if you guys noticed, but in the end credit scenes they kind of show pictures from each of the New Year's from twenty thirteen up to twenty eighteen. And in every fucking picture, Logan is in the background in some capacity. I didn't notice that. Oh my god. I didn't notice that. So like the first two or three it's just him like in the back with his spooky mask. Not the pup hood that I'm going to freak out about. <laughs> um, and then the next three years, he's wearing this like green hoodie. And then the last three years, he's wearing a black wig. Oh. So <laughs> they don't recognize him. Are you sure I don't... it wasn't the unknown from the Wonka experience in Glasgow? <laughs> <laughs> it most definitely was. <laughs> um, it just was so superficial. After this really compelling friend dynamic and the illusion that the writing is pretty good and then this turd that is just dropped at the end of the film ugh yeah ugh NJ what are your thoughts yeah I thought I thought that he went a little bit like bunny boiler over one kiss like my god like you guys didn't even sleep together like how can you fixate on something this much like i'm exhausted just thinking of the mental like strain that this had to cause well and to like push it a little bit further too there's that scene in the pool which we're getting a lot of you know exposition about the backgrounds of these characters and cam is on grinder what we assume you know you hear the little <laughs> uh, um and they're kind of making fun of him and talking about how one night stands aren't real or they're not as connective. Yeah. And Logan gives this diatribe of just how he can't do one night stands because I not for him. yeah ah the not them. for me and I just want a real deep connection and I just wanted to smack him. Um, <laughs> it's just the prudish thing to say well, everything he does in this film is completely like fuck boy. the opposite of that <laughs> why would you if you have a problem with cam because he walked away from a midnight kiss that was really special to you on new year's this is sounding insane as i say it <laughs> why would you then go out with his ex-boyfriend for x amount of years get engaged to him even though he's the most insufferable person have sex with him which is clearly a big deal to you while you're on this like revenge arc to you know get the guy who walked away from your kiss like would you really be the person who did that would you really want to fuck joel if if it was all so important and you needed that connection does the connection need to be hatred for you are you insane so yeah well and then you see him at the the new year's party when he's being very stubborn about the new year's kiss rule and joel kind of co coaxes him into it and within like 10 minutes, he's got one guy on his dick and one guy on his mouth. And yeah. it's like, what? What is, you were just saying in the pool how you can't <laughs> do this. Yeah. And what, three hours later, you got Ralph and Ernie? <laughs> Those are Speaking terrible of the club, names. Though, 
<laughs> exactly. that's, that's obviously what they were called, though. Speaking, speaking of the club, though, why was he there in his get-up? There's this one I... scene where he's just there in the black hood and the, and the, the leather mask, and And where is why? he stashing? Where is yeah, he stashing? He doesn't have a bag up. with him. <laughs> but, like, it just reminded me of that scene in Scream 1 where Sydney and Tatum are outside on Tatum's porch, and then they're talking about how much of a slut Cindy's mum was and, you know, how many times can you hear the Richard Gear gerbil story before it starts to sound true? And then in the background, you just see either Billy or Stu in the in the scream, full scream get-up sneaking through yeah. the bushes. I'm like, they're looking for you. Stop it. Like, why are you doing this? And the same later on in the, in the grocery store. He's just there in the scream mask holding a knife. Like, I'm pretty sure the police are, like, right next to you. You should stop doing this. It's very, very stupid. But, like, yeah. who was he trying to scare or watch or by know. wearing that in the club? There was no need for it. He was supposed to be there. Like, there was no need for him to be wearing a disguise. This is nothing related to the film, but just Max's inner gay screaming. Um, I am not a club person. I don't do the nightclub scene. I never really have. But the molly and the glitter... And the bodies, I can smell the men, and ugh, is yeah. too sweaty. And I don't know if Molly makes you that sweaty, but good God. It does. I um, have well, heard it. I could, could, yes. I could. Uh, okay. From, from experience, it does. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it does, it feels like, I don't understand people who do uppers, though, to be honest, because I feel like I'm having an anxiety or a panic attack the entire time I'm doing stuff like that, but was doing stuff like that. I don't anymore. I'm a good boy now. Hmm. I just drink excessively. It's fine. Um, hey, I'm right there with you. <laughs> like an it's adult. <laughs> yeah. As is my right. <laughs> exactly. But Am yeah, I uh, sipping a glass of wine right now? Maybe. It wasn't 5 a.m. here. I would <laughs> definitely be joining you on that one. But, like, yeah, I, I can't. I, I, I'm the same. I, I don't understand the whole, like, club culture. You can imagine walking into that dark room and what it smells like. Just oh, or all... the bathroom. The oh. bathroom. Ass all those and balls. It was just all balls was those small. bottoms douching out, and the sweat, and the semen, and ugh. you just ugh. stick to the floor. Just stick to it. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. Yikes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Gross. I miss so being now... able to smoke inside just for that very reason. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna take a three-minute break while we all vomit, and we'll be back. <laughs> um. NJ, what did you have something here about Hannah's token fruit fly status? Break that down for us. We we did touch on it a little bit in the prose, but again, she was the only um, female character, I believe, in the entire movie, other than maybe like a waitress, maybe. If, I don't know. But Oh yeah, the waitress. Oh, the huge part of the waitress that broke that <laughs> lovely actress's career. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's in everything now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And it, they did play it a little bit stereotypical, you know, like the fag hag in a way. Mm -hmm. Although yeah. she was much more likable than some sure. that have been depicted before. Um, yeah. I mean, it's not like my biggest gripe by any means, but I was just like, all right, like, let her get laid. Come on. Like, let's just... I know. She could have well, had the, the go-go boy, couldn't she? Right. I was just going to say they had, they were having sexy eyes with each other. Yeah. Why not give her something to distract her at the house? So maybe her involvement there. I was just, my heart broke. If I was in that situation and my best friend was just, you know, watching Netflix on the couch while I was getting laid outside, I'd be like, no. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's not that important. Like New Year's is just is ridiculous anyway. It's one of my least favorite holidays ever. And I think it would have been nicer if he'd have just gone. I'm sorry, strange man who followed me home, but I'm going to go and spend some time yeah. with this this amazing friend who's been there through all of this. Can and has we been talking me down the entire time? Can we fucking talk about Dante just showing up? Yeah, he that followed was him from Grinder. That that house is miles away from the club. Right. Like did he? Did he drive what? there? Because there's no car there at the end of it. Like, was he just looking at the grinder distance and being like, "Oh, I'm getting closer. Oh, I'm getting further away." And imagine oh. how much that cab would have cost on New Year's to to try and drive around trying to find this mysterious house. Like, but you forget, Elton. He worked at that house, so he knows where it is. Oh, but how did he know that that was the <laughs> house, though? <laughs> oh. uh, when 
when Cam was like, oh, this is either really creepy or really cute. I was like, no, Cam, creepy, consent. What is happening? Yeah, and he's got his Ugh. own room inside. Why are they fucking on a fucking day bench outside? Ugh. Just asking to be murdered, really. Mm -hmm. Or like a mosquito just go though. up your butt. Like, ugh, no. <laughs> ugh. <laughs> or bite your... Or bite your dick. That wouldn't be fun for anybody. No. <laughs> There's only one person who should be biting dicks here, and it's not the mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> oh lord. I, oh I my god. And, and also, sorry, I just got to. I just got to say as well. Yeah. While they're outside having their talk, and Dante's like, "You're a Taurus." And I was like, oh, oh my, my god. god, what is going on with the astrology girly stuff in this as well? Like, the beginning just... when Cam's doing a tarot, a tarot reading and he pulls the death card and he's trying to, like, play it off as, like, oh, it's all about new beginnings. And then it's like, oh my god, I knew you were a Pisces. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. To be fair, Tauros and Pisces are very compatible with each other, but it just was <laughs> unneeded. Yeah. Uh... One thing I want Elton, to Elton, what are you? Back. What are you, though? I need to know your zodiac. So I'm a Pisces, actually. Oh, I knew it! <laughs> Did you, though? Did you really? No, I didn't. No. <laughs> no I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very bad Pisces. Pisces are supposed to be all, like, you know, caring and, and deep and emotional and stuff. I'm, like, dead inside, so. So you're the dead fish yes. rather than the living fish. Yeah, I'm one of the fish from. What's that place called with the bad water? Oh, never mind. Uh, the Dead Sea? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. <laughs> NJ, I interrupted you. What were you about to say? So, the other thing I had a problem with, going back to Hannah, sorry, um, at this club, it's implying that all of these men are, sh are totally gay. It, like, negates any type of bisexuality. Yes. Yeah. You know? Yeah, or pan, also, or demi, yeah, anything. Exactly. Yeah, also, anything. gay clubs have lesbians in them. Why was she still the only girl there? I, like, know. I, I know there are separate lesbian and gay clubs and stuff, but you think if you're going to a big party at New Year's, there's right? going to be more than just the gays there, right? No, exactly. it was just Hannah, the only one. It was weird. Um, I have two big pet peeves, real big ones, so I'm going to step on my soapbox here. Get ready, guys. <laughs> um uh why was every single man in this entire movie just cut not the foreskin way but the body way <laughs> the the abs the muscles the oil they were all perfect specimens of masculinity and i wanted to vomit um, i'm gonna say something really really unpopular now but in gay town i think they all had normal bodies like they were the every man they weren't supposed to be like we're really toned and we're really ripped everyone in this had like a normal body in this film so you yeah. disagree i disagree it's a, oh. aside from aside from um logan who obviously is naturally gifted with great genetics <laughs> they all had just quite quite normal sort of natural bodies I didn't think that anyone was overly buff. I mean, at the club, obviously, there was there were more people like sure. it, there was a lot more people that just had like very very straightforward normal bodies. There was no fat people though. That was that's um. Yeah, and I guess maybe that's what I'm trying to convey. Yeah, I yeah. would have liked to see the bears, the dad bods, the yeah, the kind of thicker boys. But yeah, now that I I'm trying to think of the the pool scene, and yeah, Joel and Cam at least were they were toned, but they weren't. Like, I don't know. I think ripped. Joel was actually actually meant to be or, the you know, bear. I think he was supposed to be the bear because he was really really hairy, and you never really got a body shot of him because I think it may be the. I know the director does a lot of like uh, photography with like really handsome androgynous and and like skinny twinky tweaked out looking models and stuff like that. So I think maybe Joel was supposed mm. to be the fat one. I have huh. a very good explanation for this. All of the all of the bear men, they don't go to Palm Springs for New Year's. They go to Big Bear. E oh. <laughs> oh god! Wow! Now I know everything. Yeah. Oh my god! 
Make sure you cut that out. Don't embarrass her. <laughs> <laughs> no, like I mentioned earlier, it will stay in. We'll just make it louder and repeat three times. Echo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big bear, 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 bear. Oh, <laughs> no, I, I, I kind of agree in, in a sense that probably actually with the, the way the gay world works, the bears probably had their own like heavy substance meth party in some kind of rundown dungeon where everyone was wearing a chest harness so yeah that's maybe. that's fair yeah good point good point um in that vein why why is there a pup hood why is it like the scary thing it just i felt like there was a lot of subtext there of ooh kink bdsm it's scary we're gonna make our villain wear a pup hood it's just i was bamboozled I'm very kink forward and kink positive, and I just felt like this was, it just wasn't needed. There are so many scarier things than a guy in a dog mask. Well, I mean, I get to, I get the fact that it's sort of, it's a mask that's kind of ingrained within gay culture. Sure. Sort of fetishism and stuff like that, so it made him able to go onto the radar in the club. But I don't think Ryan had ever really met him before in the first scene, so why was he wearing a mask at all? Yeah. And he was going to kill him, so he wasn't planning on him ever being able to tell anyone anyway. So why was he wearing a costume at all? And I, I think there's about a lot of slashes, to be fair. Like, why are they... If they're going in there to kill someone and their intention is to kill someone and walk out of there, why are they wearing a mask? It just... All it does is just make your field of vision much, much smaller and make you more <laughs> yeah. prone to be overcome by the person you're attacking. That sure. is true, but have you ever thought about is maybe uh, Logan's kink wearing a leather pup hood and killing people? Oh yeah, mm. true. Yeah, that is that's a good point. That's true. And he is um, a fucking psychopath bottom. So right, he is. Wow, NJ, way to sh change my life. Thanks okay. a lot. You're welcome. Move that up You're into welcome. the pros then. <laughs> <laughs> it gave it gave uh, it gave a character a strong kink that he used for, for his own positive reinforcement. I love it. I love it. Exactly. <laughs> It all makes sense now. <laughs> like I also, I also get the fact. Like I don't genuinely think there was any need for him to be wearing a mask at all, except for that last scene where he reveals himself. Because yeah. obviously, the reveal at the end of a, a horror movie, who's it, who's it been all along, is something sure. that the horror movies have been building up to for years and years and years since the nineties, maybe before. Um, so I love that, and I love a whodunit, and I love like. But there were so few characters in this. There was only a few who could have done it. And the other right. three living people in this film were in the room while he was there. So, like, it had to have been him. There was no mystery there, really. Right. Uh, any final comments or concerns with the film before we give this boy a rating? I find it very concerning all over, to be honest. No. Um, <laughs> I, I would just like to say, as much as I, as much as I pick this apart, I'm pretty sure this is the best kind of uh gay slasher we've had in 20 years since since hellbent was also a bit of a mess and i yeah, I, I liked it just for the sheer entertainment value of it to be honest the casting was phenomenal blumhouse have to do a really really good job of making quality products on a shoestring budget yeah and uh and they they got you know everything i wanted and this this um particular episode of the into the dark one is actually one of the lowest rating rated ones of both seasons Really? And I personally think that's homophobia. I right do too, actually, a little bit. Because, because I've, I, seen, I've seen some of the other ones, and they're, they're not anything spectacular either. Yeah, this one, just I feel, I feel like it got like partially full. It's got like so much going for it, and it's... So let's talk about ratings here. So on a scale of 1 to 10 for Screams, how scary was this film? 1 being a Disney film, and 10 being the Evil Dead remake for Max. <laughs> I gave it a two. It's not scary. Yeah, two as well. Not not very scary. Yeah, I I, I agree with a two. It it had tense moments. Yeah, um, and it had a lot of camp, which I think negated a lot of the scary. Mm -hmm. I think it was very atmospheric, but it wasn't scary. Agreed. Yeah. All right. As far as crowns go, now same scale, one to ten. One being. <laughs> oh my god, you changed your rating over the course of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Um, okay, so I gave the movie a 5.5. I started out at a 6, and then I bumped it up to a 6.5, but then as we were talking, it was like, okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> I 
it's a fun film. I think we talked a little bit earlier about it can be a fun movie and not a great movie, and that's okay. Um, so five point five for me. Fair, fair. I'm I'm giving it a six. Um, I. Like you are you so said, generous with your ratings, NJ. I'm a lesbian. We're very giving people. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more, though, why you give it a six. <laughs> I, I found it to be... Um, I like my horror to have a side of humor. So I enjoyed all of the little like in jokes and and the banter and whatnot. So the the friend group really bumps it up for me, honestly. Mm. Um, okay. And then I I enjoyed the kills and the attempted kill of Joel. Like I kind of wanted to see what the firecrackers would do to his head. Yeah, that's that would, true. That would have been good. And Elton, what'd you give it? I gave it a six as well. Um. Despite all of the flaws and all of the problems, I think it was a really nicely put together piece. It was only sort of like you say, eighty minutes long. A TV movie, not on a full film budget. It had a great cast. The director, I'm a big fan of, like I said before, I'm a big fan of his other work. He was the same director who did the movie adaptation of The Ruins. He um he did Jamie Marks' is Dead, he did uh Swallowed and The Passenger. Um he he's got like a really, really good backlog of uh, films. This is probably his weakest one, but I I'm a big, huge Carter Smith fan. So um, and it just it looked good. It looked like a really good quality product. So yeah, it six. Did, yeah, agreed. All right. Um, to wrap us up, does anyone have any memorable New Year's Eve kisses? No. Do yeah. I? I'm so boring. I just refuse to leave I... the house, and then if I am outside of the house for New Year's Eve, I'm usually working. So, yeah, my fiance and I were going to go to a New Year's Eve party last year, and then we decided to just stay inside and eat Arby's food. So oh, that was our, like that. Uh, yeah, nothing exciting. I purposely try and miss it. There's, there's always this pressure on New Year's that, like, you've got to have fun. You've got to stay up. You've got to be with the people. You've got to be laughing and smiling and have that perfect person to kiss at midnight. Blah, blah, blah. I was just yeah. like, no, I'm not. I'm not really into it. I like to be in bed by about like nine o'clock on most days anyway. I'll stay up till ten on New Year's Eve, but I want to eat some cheese and go to bed gassy. So, <laughs> oh, it. see, we are friends, Elton. <laughs> Absolutely, oh, we're the same gosh. person. I find <laughs> we are, <laughs> except you were born in the better country. Oh, um, don't know about that. Yeah, all we right. Invented you, so you know you're just you're just like the the. The little baby offspring of Britain. Oh, that's so true. technically, racist... Elton's your daddy. <gasps> oh, oh, Daddy Elton. Daddy. <laughs> America is just the little tiny offspring of the the racist former superpower. So mm -hmm. that's that's fair. Yeah. Uh, I will be referring to you as Daddy now. In Twitter. <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> that's fine. I am. I am a big hairy man. So it's a. Uh, it fits. it fits. And I am a thin, uh, not hairy man. What's the word for not hairy? So twink. we're a match made in heaven. <laughs> You're a twink or an, an aged twink. I'm an aged twink. I've been told it's called a twunk, and twunk. I don't like that. <laughs> what? <laughs> See, See, a, a twunk is a cross between a twink and a hunk, so I think it's a slightly more muscular twink. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So, what am I? I'm not either one of those things. Maybe you're like an otter with alopecia. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> we should make up a new one for you. You're a sphinx cat. <laughs> <laughs> Stop this! <laughs> I need a shirt that says I'm an otter with alopecia, <laughs> but then also I'm creating a new gay term called a sphinx. I'm not an otter. I'm not a bear. I'm not a twink. You're I'm one of sphinx. those terrifying sphinx cats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh dear. dear lord. I apologize. All right. <laughs> I'm delirious. It's quarter past five. <laughs> oh, you need to go to bed. Uh, how is everyone staying spooky? Who wants to go ah, first? I shall go, if you uh, wouldn't mind. Oh, um, with due pleasure. Is it all right if I go, Governor? 
Absolutely. Was pop off in here. <laughs> <laughs> pop off, sis. <laughs> yeah, pop off. <laughs> So I have already seen this, but we um, we went to a horror con this last couple weekends, uh, Horror Hound in Cincinnati, and there was a lot of cosplayers that were doing Midsommar, and my wife Ugh. had never seen it, and so I showed her Midsommar, and her mind was blown. She said it so was good. one of the best horror movies she's ever seen, and she, like, hates lots of stuff, so there's that. <laughs> A24, Hi. baby. A24. A24 <laughs> is gold. I also want you to introduce me to her as, Hi, Max, this is my wife. She hates a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and she'll be like, that's fair. <laughs> oh, good. Good. I can't wait to hate you, too. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, more so like movies, but yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> as far as other media, I'm reading... Lies That Bind by Ray Knowles and April Yates. Um, so this is a sapphic horror that features a couple that run a scam seance business in an I, English... Can, yeah. Can I pause you? What is sapphic horror? I've never heard that phrase before. Lesbian. Lesbian. <gasps> oh, let's not talk about it. Lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> No, one third of your content has to be lesbian content. You signed her on to be a, a, a host. You have to listen to her lesbianism. That's true. That's true. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Keep going. Anyway. <laughs> Sapphic horror. <laughs> <laughs> so this couple, they ran a, a seance business. It's obviously a scam. And they live in England. So you would like it, Elton, because that's all that qualifies. Anything that you like is England. <laughs> England, um, yeah. That tracks, and, that tracks. Yeah. Their life is uh, upended by a mysterious yet evil yet hot stranger. <gasps> Ooh. Is it a girl, stranger? Yes, it is a girl. Oh, wow. Elton, how have you been saying spooky? Wait, did you finish, NJ? Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm finished, sorry. Yeah, I love uh, Ray Knowles and April Gates as well, so I'm really looking forward to reading Lies That Mind. I have been staying spooky by watching Midnight Kiss twice, um, obviously. <laughs> Can't watch it once. You've got to go back and just appreciate it. Um, and Clearly. And, you know. But aside from that, I have been doing some reading. Um, and there is a book by my very, very best friend, um, Brett Mitchell Kent. Um, his debut novel, Whispers of Apple Blossoms, releases on the 1st of May from Lethe Press, who published Next of Kin. And it is a gloriously sinister sort of semi-romantic bit gothic a bit um, supernatural story about this, this elderly woman Edna who thinks that she's communicating with her deceased husband through the house plant um, oh, it's, twist. it's so good it's, it's told in one of those um, time jumpy narratives as well so you gradually get bits of mysteries unfold, unfolded from previous and their lives together and the relationship between Edna and Henry is, the, is honestly the cutest thing I've ever read um, there is some gay representation in it as well in um, a couple of the characters and it's it's perfect and I think everyone should pre-order a copy now, it's available on Lethe Press's website in paperback get it on Amazon we plan on having him on too I want to collect the whole set I'm going to get you, Chelsea Brett, you're like my starter Pokemon Oh, yeah. Bulbasaur, Charmander, Squirtle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they would love that. And and Brett honestly is just one of the funniest people as well. He'll, I think he's quite jealous as well that me and Chelsea have, have spoken to you before, and he, he's he's not like in on the on on the NJ. So he, he he's desperate to be friends. <laughs> There's plenty of me to go around. Now. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have been staying spooky with I recently watched Voyage of the Demeter um, and when I saw the trailer for this film I guffawed I thought this is ridiculous it's just snakes on a plane but vampires on a boat um, and so Mark and I watched it one night thinking it would be a movie to make fun of and we were actually quite taken aback it was a very well developed film the acting was incredible and it had a lot of fun scares, and you think you know what's going to happen, but 
Dracula's pretty tricky. He has some surprises. Uh, highly recommend it. You can watch it on Paramount Plus if you have that subscription. And then I also have been following the Chad and Lori Daybell case out here in Utah. Um, a lot of people know them as the Doomsday Children Murders. Uh, they are ex-Mormons who ended up killing their spouses so they could be together and then also killed their children. So it's Oh, yeah. Pretty... This is, that's great. No, I mean, it's, it's not great. Gnarly. It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, as an ex-Mormon myself and Utah being Mormon Vatican City, uh, there's a lot of connections to the religion. Of course, they take it and make it really vile and extreme. Lori was just sentenced to life in jail with no parole. And Chad's trial just started today, actually. Uh, after I finished Midnight Kiss, I watched the live stream of his trial. So that was kind wow. of fun. That's intense. Uh, there's a really good book that I recommend if anyone's interested. It's called The Blood Turn or The Moon Turns to Blood. It's by Leah Sutili. Um, I listened to it on Audible. Uh, it was a freebie, and it's so fascinating how these people take religion and basically just do whatever they want and say, God told us to do it, so it's fine. <laughs> anyway, everyone, if you are still listening, we love you because we are just a crazy bunch of coconuts, but we love what we do. Thanks for listening. Uh, Elton, it's been a pleasure. You are a kindred spirit from across the pond. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I've been really excited to come on, and I'm a big fan of the show, and, and both of you, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you next. Can you tell our listeners where they can find you on the internets? Mainly just at the bottom of a well. Um, <gasps> oh, fun! Yeah. No, um, uh, uh, you can find me on Facebook, Elton Skelter, um, you can find me on Twitter at Elton Skelter or at Elton underscore Skelter. That one is uh, TikTok, uh, Instagram, all the same. I'm not very active. I am trying to set up a website as well, so that that's incoming. Um, but yeah, just just find me and add me and, and try and not scare me. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Stay spooky. Stay spooky.